working. He never stopped, he never stopped working. Cause even when I don't see it, you're working. they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown, grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence that is here. And Lord, my prayer is that we would feel that presence of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we would hear your heart, that through the anointing of the Holy Spirit on your word, that Lord, we hear you. We hear what you have to say. Hey, we will be ministered by you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, for the last several weeks, we have been looking at the champions of the faith. Um, and the reason, and the reason why is to get a glimpse, to get a glimpse of the nature of overcoming faith. We've looked at Enoch, Noah, and Abraham, and each of them reveal something about the components to real faith. The kind of faith that works. The kind of faith that gets you through. The kind of faith that works in a real world. 
the kind of faith that rises above the calamity and the chaos and the insanity and the kind of faith that moves mountains and the kind of faith that brings change. Now, Noah, you know his story. He heard God's warning. He took it seriously. The Bible says he moved with fear. He prepared an ark that would bring salvation to his family. He got into salvation. That's what faith does. It gets you into a safe place. Faith gets you into Christ. Secondly, we looked at uh, Enoch. Enoch didn't do any miracles. He didn't do anything fantastic, nothing sensational. He walked with God. He communed with God. He had a relationship with God. That's what faith does. It takes you into a real living relationship with a real living God. Man, that's good. Got to have that. And then finally, we looked at um, Abraham. Faith is always going to be tested. And Abraham gave us a lesson. Trust God when it all looks hopeless. Trust God when you don't understand. Trust God when everything is stacked against you. Trust God. That was the message from Abraham. Well, today, we are looking at another piece to this overcoming faith. We are looking at Moses. And what it tells us about Moses is he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now, perseverance sounds a little vanilla. It sounds like a little dull. I mean, you don't talk about perseverance. Does that mean that the sermon's going to be long and I'm going to have to practice perseverance? It might be. <laughs> it could, it could. I'll tell you what, you know, when I did this at first, uh, you know, and, and you guys got to. You guys understand, I really love you guys. Because after I first got the sermon done, I went through the whole thing, and it took 50 minutes. Yeah, yeah. But I cut, all, I cut a lot of stuff out. It was really good stuff, but I cut it all out because I want to give you the basics, all right? All right, anyways. So, so no, it's not going to be extra long. <laughs> all right. I should leave it there. But with faith, there are no shortcuts. There is no path of least resistance. There's pain. It, it, it's not a painless journey. Faith is a fight. It will be challenged. Your faith will be tested by circumstances and by situations. And sometimes it's tested by your own thought patterns, your own fears and your own doubts and your own belief. The thing that's going through your head challenges your faith. I will say this, all spiritual growth and all spiritual success will call for perseverance. It takes perseverance. Faith and perseverance are connected. It takes perseverance to be successful in prayer. It takes perseverance to learn how to recognize the leading of God in your life. It takes perseverance to find strength for the battle that you're going through. It takes perseverance to stand in the midst of a spiritual war. It takes faith. It takes perseverance to bring the kind of unfailing love and grace into our families and to our friends. It takes perseverance to advance the kingdom of God. And let me tell you this. Without perseverance, you cannot win. And with perseverance, you cannot lose. It's that important. It's everything. It's, it's really what faith is. It means to be steadfast. It means to continue. It means to endure. It means to stand. In fact, the Greek word means it says hyperstand. Well, look, I don't know how you hyperstand. It. That's, I'm, I'm hyper in a lot of other things. I'm not standing anymore. I'm walking. But listen, here's the important thing. Here's what I want you to get. Biblical perseverance. It is not just grit your teeth and bear it. Oswald Chambers said it this way. Perseverance is more than endurance. It's endurance combined with absolute assurance, absolute certainty that what we are looking for is going to happen. 
That's perseverance. It's not just hanging on. It's endurance with attitude. It's endurance with confidence. It's endurance with assurance. It's endurance knowing that God is going to show up. That he's going to get you through. That's what perseverance. It means you know it's going to pay off. It's, you're going to win in the end. All right. Now, behind every move of God, behind every success, and behind every triumph, behind every work of the kingdom, behind every miracle, behind every answer to prayer, is a believer who endured, who hung in there, who kept believing, who had this really relentless, refused to back down, refused to quit, I know God is going to show up attitude. That's, in, that's perseverance with attitude. In fact, Jesus said it this way. You got a problem? You got a situation? You're going through something? He said this. Men ought always to pray and never give up. That's Jesus' word to us this morning. You need to keep praying and never give up. You need to keep fighting. Actually, he said it this way. Because actually the literal translation of this verse says, ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking. Seek and keep seeking. Believe and keep believing. Obey and keep obeying. Fight and keep fighting. Press and keep pressing. That's it. attitude. Ian Bounds was one of the great warriors of prayer in the 20th century. He said, our praying needs to be pressed and pursued with energy that never tires, a persistency that will not be denied, and a courage that never fails. That's perseverance with attitude. I'm getting on this path. I'm getting where God told me to get to. Now I'm standing here. I'm going to fight here. I'm not giving up. All right. Now Moses uh, gives us a lesson on perseverance. You pretty much know his story. When he was a child, Pharaoh demanded that all the Egyptian or that all the Hebrew males were to be slain. Moses' parents defied that word. They believed that God had a calling for their child. So she defied. She made the little basket, she put him in it, she floated him down the Nile. Then, by the design of God, Pharaoh's daughter took Moses out of the water, adopted him, and she actually hired Moses' own mother to nurse and look after him as a baby. Now, we're not long. We don't know how long Moses' mother was able to speak into his life, but one thing is clear. He knew he was an Israelite. She had said something. She had planted a seed. She had planted that word in his heart, and he knew he was an Israelite. And he knew there was a God. And he knew God had a purpose for his life. That's probably all he knew. And it says in uh, Acts chapter 7, verses 23 and 25, that when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart. Let me tell you something, parents. The word is powerful. The word changes. It, you know, after 40 years... Of, 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 of all Egypt had to offer and how Egypt died, indoctrinated him. After 40 years, that word of God that was planted by his mother in her child's life began to take root. It began to form. It began to change his convictions. And here's what it says. He was full 40 years old. He came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. After seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him. Avenged him, he that was pressed. And I love this. And he smote the Egyptian. Yeah, I've been smoted a few times in my life when I was a child. Don't walk like an Egyptian, smote like an Egyptian. In verse 25, it says, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. Now, what does all that have to do with perseverance? Well, look, Moses did have a calling, just like you have a calling. Moses did have a purpose, but he was not ready. Now, yes, he had acquired all the learning, 
all the training of the most advanced nation in the world. He was an expert in the religion, the philosophy, the arts and the sciences and the architecture of Egypt, but he was not ready. And when I say he was not ready, I'm saying his faith was not ready, his character was not ready, and his walk with God was not ready yet. Now he had been chosen, he had a purpose, but he wasn't ready. And at this point, he had one major problem. He had one issue that rose above every other issue. He had one problem that absolutely had to be dealt with. Look, God wanted to answer the prayers. God wanted to set his people free. God wanted to put them in a promised land. That was his plan. That was his design. But before he could do that, through Moses, this issue had to be dealt with. And I'll tell you what, this is the issue that every one of us in here is dealing with right now. Same issue. You know what it is? You know what Moses' problem was? He was full of self. That was it. He was full of himself. And if he's going to be used by God, Self has to die. He was in self-will, self-centeredness, self-centered desires, self-dreams, self-goals. Self stands in the way, it stands in the, it opposes the plan and the work of God. And if you want the kingdom of God in your life, and if you want the kingdom of God in your family, then you have to die to the kingdom of self. There is just no other way. Now look at this. Um, says, now see what look, look. He was going through a process, and that process requires perseverance. Now let me just give you a little lesson about salvation. I know I've done this before, but I'm going to do it again. Because that's what old people do. We tell the same things over and over again. But the good thing is most of you are kind of old too, so you forget what I said. And so it's just like saying it new. That's the great thing about being old in an old church. But anyways, so here's the point. I'm sorry. Here's the point. Something about salvation and perseverance. Look, the moment that you call on Christ to save you, the moment you trust him as your savior, the moment you give your life to Jesus, you are instantly saved. You are fully saved. You are completely saved. You are totally saved. You are in the family. You are complete in him at that exact moment. It's instant. So but when we say we're saved, we are saved from the penalty. We're instantly saved from the penalty of sin. But the moment you surrender your life to Christ, a process starts. And it's a process that requires perseverance. It's an inner struggle. What is it? It's the process of being saved or being saved from the control or from the power of sin. That's the struggle. John the Baptist said it the easiest way possible. He said, I, self, must decrease and he must increase. That's it. That's the struggle. That's spiritual growth. It's where self decreases and where Jesus increases. That's spiritual growth. Paul said it this way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and who gave himself for me. So here's what happens. At the moment that you trust Christ, you are instantly saved from the penalty of sin. While you are on earth, you are in the process of being saved. From the control of sin. And on one glorious morning, the trump of God will sound. The dead in Christ, the Baptist, will rise first. <laughs> Sorry. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, there's coming a day, 
Yes, we've been saved from penalty. And yes, we are being saved from the control. But there's coming a day when we will be saved completely and entirely from the presence of sin. It will be a memory. Amen. That day is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, so Moses, like all of us, had to be taken to school. Look at verse 25. This is uh, Acts chapter 7. He says, he supposed his brethren. See, he assumed that his brothers. See, he assumed, oh, see my, see me? See my training? See my, see my gifts? See my influence? See my knowledge? See that? He supposed that they would see that he was the one that God was going to use. But the scripture says, they understood him not. He was arrogant. So, you know, you think, well, he wasn't ready. What was it going to take to get Moses ready? Well, here's the story. He spent 40 years being indoctrinated by the philosophy and the religion and the isms of Egypt. So I guess God said, well, to fix that, I'm going to give him 40 years on a mountainside, 40 years in exile, 40 years being a reject, 40 years tending sheep. That ought to fix it. And, and you know, there's no way, there's no way Moses could have understood why it was taking so long. And I know you've been there too. Why is this taking so long? Why is this so hard? Why is this not happening the way I think it should happen? What, what is going on? It's getting kind of heavy. Doesn't look like he's on a mountain. Look at his sheep. It doesn't look like anything is happening. It doesn't look like anything is going on. It looks hopeless. And now he's 80. I'm so thankful God uses old people. He uses old people all throughout scripture. Hallelujah. I've still got a few years before I get to 80. Maybe another month or two. I don't know. I lost track. It's a long time ago. But here's the point about perseverance. Where do you find tenacity in faith? Where do you find the kind of relentlessness that will not give up? Where do you find the kind of endurance with attitude? When all of it looks just like nothing, you've heard a promise, you know there's a promise, and somehow nothing looks like it's happening. How do you deal with that? How do you keep your faith strong? How do you persevere? Well, here's what I'm told. Here's what we're told. Moses gives us an answer to that. He says, one, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. No, that doesn't mean, it means he did not see God with his physical eyes. Something in his heart. Something in his mind. Something that had been told to him by his mother years ago. He began to sense it. There's something there. So it says this. When he saw God, here's what he saw. I'm going to tell you three, three things he saw. One, he saw a new identity. Verse 24 says that by, so when he saw God, he saw his new identity. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He figured out who he was. He did not belong to Pharaoh's daughter. He did not belong to Egypt. He did not belong to this world. In fact, his new identity was not based on accomplishment. It was not based on his human lineage. It was not based on his wealth or his knowledge. No, his identity was not based on anything that humans use to establish identity. His identity that he adopted and that he embraced was the identity that was given to him by God. God says, you're my child. You're chosen. You're picked. He belonged to the family of God. Now look, let me just mention this here because Moses, his understanding of identity would have only been a shadow of what we have been given, the identity that we have been given through Jesus Christ. Do you know who you are in Christ? 
Do you know, really know, what you've been given? First Corinthians 2, 5 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Here's my identity. Here's your identity. Once you receive Christ, you're in. You're in the family. You're redeemed. Your debt has been paid. You have been chosen. You've been restored. You've been adopted. You are a joint heir. You are a son and a daughter of God who's been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Amen. And, and this is the one that actually just blows my mind. We are the righteousness of Christ. Do you know what that means? That means God sees every believer the way he sees Jesus. He loves every believer. He loves you with the same degree and the same passion that he loves Jesus. God loves you like he loves Jesus, the same love. Because you are the righteousness of Christ. Now that means that the perfection of Christ and the victory of Christ and all that Jesus earned and all that Jesus did and all that he is, all of his righteousness is placed into my account. I am a son and, and, uh, and you, we are sons and we are daughters of God. We have been given the righteousness of Christ. You know what that means? That means I can endure with attitude. See, see, that means I have access to God. I have standing. It means that God is for me. It means that God is with me. It means that God is in me. It means that he welcomes me into his presence. He's listening to me. He says all of the promises of Christ are yours now. They are given to you. They're in your account you know what that means when it comes to endurance? It means that no matter what happens, and it means and that it doesn't matter what I have to face, and it doesn't matter what I have to go through, everything I need has been placed in me through the work of Jesus Christ. I've been given everything. I can endure. I can make it through. I can walk. I can be strong. I can become what God has called me to be. I can endure with attitude. I know it's coming. I know he hears me. I'm, I know I have this confidence. The answer is on the way. Step in there. Because I know who I am. I know who you are. By the grace of God, I am. It's kind of like verse 26. He regarded this grace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So, so when he saw God, he saw a new identity. When he saw God, he saw greater value. Reminds me of page 252 of the Heavenly Highway hymns at Cherry Valley United Baptist Church. I'd rather have Jesus. That's the song. You know, I came across this. George Beverly Shea was given a poem back in the late 40s, early 50s, by his mother. On a Sunday afternoon, she took this poem and she placed it on his piano. And she said, this poem needs a melody. And it just so happened at that very same time that George Beverly Shea had been offered a lucrative contract by a well-known, famous New York recording company. The poem came just at the right time. It helped him, it says. And instead of choosing a lucrative, high-paying, secular recording contract, he chose to work and he chose to sing with a unknown young evangelist named Billy Graham. He sang a song. He's saying this song, I'd rather have Jesus all over the world for the next 60 years. He says, over the years, I have not sung any song more than I'd rather have Jesus. 
but I never grow weary of Miss Miller's heartfelt words. The words, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything that this world affords today. That's what Moses is coming to. I'd rather have Jesus. That's where the saints go when they see him. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather be Jesus. I'd rather walk with Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. There's nothing in this life that's more valuable than a lifelong friend. And there's no greater friend that you will ever find than Jesus. Because if you're a believer, here's the truth. He gave you everything. He became cursed so that we could be blessed. He became poor so that we could be rich. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. He was separated from his father so that we could be joined forever. He died so that we could live. What he gave us was not just a gift. He didn't just give us a, a, an idea or a thing. No, he gave us himself. He gave me a life and a blessing that I could never earn. He gave me a relationship that I could never attain to. And he gave me a place that I could never reach on my own. See, all I had was rags. All I had was nothing. I had nothing to offer him. I had nothing to give him. And yet he says, come unto me. Come walk with me. Come be with me. Come follow me. Come be my disciple. Come be my friend. That's the invitation. And see, when I see that, when I see all that he's done, when I see that all he has given, when I see the cross, and when I see the sacrifice, I realize that this life of endurance is not about me. I endure for him. That's why. I persevere for him. I'm living for him, for his glory. I'm willing to fight for his kingdom. I'm willing to suffer for his cause now. And I'm willing to do it with all joy. There's nothing in this life that's more joyful than being surrendered, sold out, given to Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. Paul said it this way. He said, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, I doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things that I may win Christ. That's it. He's saying, I give up everything to know him. To walk with him, to be with him. Finally, find peace. It's short. He saw a new king. It says, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Now, throughout this reading, we see that Moses saw something. He understood something. But what he understood was very small. It was a small seed. And now, here he is, he's 80 years old, hasn't seen nothing. And a divine page turns. If you had told him while he was up there on that mountain, 80 years old, what God was getting ready to do, how that God was getting ready to answer the prayer of his people, if you had told him what was getting ready to happen, he would have laughed. He would have been a whole laugh. Oh, 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 you know, one of those kind of things. But he would have laughed. There's no way he could comprehend, after 80 years of perseverance, what was getting ready 
<laughs> it says, by faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Here's the point. Page turns. God shows up. Plagues are unleashed upon Egypt. The destroyer comes. Now the Israelites are told to sacrifice a lamb for their sins, a spotless lamb. And then they were told to smear the blood of that lamb around the door, the doorpost of their home. And that when the destroyer comes and he sees the blood, he will pass over. That's Passover. And here's what happens. A page turns. Something they could have never imagined. A glory that they're going to see unseen by anyone else in this world. They walk out of Egypt with wealth and with, I mean, Egypt just shower. There's, there's jewelry and their wealth and their gold upon them. They walk out with health. There's no one feeble. There's no one sick. They are led by God's visible presence. They can see a cloud by day and a fire by night. They find themselves on the bank of the Red Sea being chased by Pharaoh's army. And the Bible says that by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. It was a complete, total victory. Now, let me just, here's the reason why I bring this up. The band, you can come. Because here's what happens when the page turns. After the endurance, his presence became real to them, tangible. His leading was clear. His power was revealed. The sea was parted. A way was made. Armies were drowned. And look, all of this occurred. All of this power, all of this freedom, all of this glory, all of this presence was made possible by the blood of a real, literal, innocent lamb. That was the old covenant. Here's what I want you to think about, just real quick. How much greater glory? What greater presence? What greater power? What greater deliverance do you suppose is waiting for those who are not under the blood of a real, literal lamb, but who are under the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. Let me just tell you something about what's happening in this world and what's going to happen in your life. The page is getting ready to turn. There's a time. Now, I'm not making any promises about when, because I don't do that. But I assure you, a promise is coming. A promise that will turn the page. You know, the other day, when I was out on my back porch, you know, my prayer is always, Lord, give me something to speak to your people. Let me share your heart. And right then, he called me crazy. I just sensed he wanted me to write something down. And here's what I wrote down. And I believe this is for somebody here, maybe all of you. Here's what he says. I am going to keep my promise to you. I am going to do something in your midst, in your life, that will surprise you. I'm taking you to a place that goes past your ability to imagine. I'm going to answer your prayer in a way that you would never expect. My promise is that on this journey, you're going to go to a place that's exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ask, think, or imagine. I know it looks difficult, and I know it looks hopeless, dark, and uncertain. I know the path ahead looks frightening and confusing. Refuse to give up. Refuse to fear. Refuse to back down. Refuse to doubt. Keep believing. Keep trusting, keep praying, keep seeking, keep pressing, and the page will turn. You will see the glory of God. You will see his promise. You will see his work. You will hear his voice, and you will be filled with the joy of the Lord. If you need prayer, you can come over here. Amen.
stand and sing together. Shout your praise, and our hearts will cry. 